I want to tell you about a new podcast called Amuse News. Publishing multiple days a week, Amuse News is your source for food news, interviews from around the food world, and more. On the show, we'll be engaging with food storytellers, from chefs to advocates to people working in the field, and many more. Find Amuse News wherever you get your podcasts. Amuse News is a destination for everyone who's looking for a new, insightful look into the world of food. This episode is brought to you by Castor and Pollux, maker of America's number one organic pet food, Organics. Look for their newest line, Pristine, the only complete line of pet food made with responsibly sourced ingredients. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org slash pets. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. We're a member-supported food radio network broadcasting over 35 weekly shows live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. Join our hosts as they lead you through the world of craft brewing, behind the scenes of the restaurant industry, inside the battle over school food, and beyond. Find us at heritageradionetwork.org. Good morning and welcome to Heritage Radio. This is The Line. Joining me today is Chef Laurent Tarandel. He was born in France and he started cooking at a very young age. He joined a four-year program at... Uh, I, Chef, I apologize for my <laughs> French. It's probably not going to be correct. Hopefully you can correct me during the course of the show. So you joined a four-year program at St. Vincent École uh, de Cuisine, and then you earned a aptitude professionnel de cuisinaire. And then after graduating from that program, you worked as chef uh, to the Admiral in the French Navy. Uh, in the years that followed, Chef worked under such notable chefs as Bruno Tisson, Jacques Maximin at Restaurant Le Dion in France, and he also worked at the Restaurant Mercury in the Hotel Intercontinental in Moscow. Chef Torondel was named Bon Appetit Magazine's Restaurant Tour of the Year in 2007. He's published three cookbooks. He currently oversees or has consulted on over 15 restaurants and projects around the world that now have locations in Miami, Hong Kong, San Juan, and even Kazakhstan. Chef, welcome to the program. Hi, good morning. <laughs> so I want to start at the beginning. So how old were you when you began to sort of pursue a career in cooking. Uh, tell us a little bit about the, uh, the four-year program that you enrolled in, and what was that like in, in France at that time? Uh, well, you know, basic um, training, cooking school. You know, um, I was 13. I was actually 12 and a half. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, we... we, we you know, we had this school uh, where I lived in France, and uh, it was called you know, three option. And my dad gave me the three option of, uh, um, you know, leaving uh, general school and then uh, getting to a boarding school where um, I was going to study uh, a job. Um, so the option was to be a chef, and then uh, the other one was to be a, a tailor, and the other one was to be an office manager. <laughs> I remember. So it's a, it was a trade school, essentially, <laughs> right? School, so you're yeah. just you right. started a very young age, and you're pursuing the job that you you have to do that job basically right. once right. you finish. Right. And so you're 12 and a half, you're 13 years old, and you start cooking. How how rigorous of a program is it? Are we talking like? white chef coats and you're learning knife skills are you in a classroom are you in a kitchen what what exactly did it consist of yeah it is it is completely a full training but uh four days a week um of cooking you know about four hours a day and the rest are general uh um general school you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, general classes and then um yeah White chef jacket, uh, knives. I mean, you know, and and I mean the good part of it. It's um, you're young, so you are willing to learn, and then uh, and then you're learning from from the beginning. You're learning the the base of cooking. You know how to chop, how to handle a knife, how to place a cutting board, how to light a stove, how to clean a pot. Uh, you're learning what's most of people actually do not know now. <laughs> yeah, it's the you start at the fundamentals, at yeah. the base of doing the things that perhaps now are overlooked and are taken for granted that someone might 
come into your kitchen or someone else's kitchen and you think, well, they probably know how to fold towels and set up a station and work cleanly, but perhaps maybe they don't. So at that time, were you thinking, oh, I've, I've made this decision because I was presented with three options and I chose one or yes. did you feel like, <laughs> so you didn't really know, oh, I'm going to be a chef and this is going to be everything that I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I mean, how do you know at 12 years old, you know, or 13 years old? I mean, you, you don't have a, a full idea of what you want to do for the rest of, of your life. So I knew cooking was a passion somehow. It was a family thing, you know. My grandparents were cooking. My dad, my mom, everybody was cooking. We we lived in the in the house with a garden, so you know it was sort of like the natural thing for me. I knew already more than anyone else at school. What you know? did your parents do? Where did you grow up, and what what sort of careers or life did did you have growing uh, up outside of? Uh... We grew up in a small town in France, um, in the center of France, and then uh, my parents were. Uh, um, you know, living in a house with my parents and we had a, a garden in the back and then we'll cook every day different stuff. And, you know, that was the... Did you, the, did your father have a, a specific job or was he a farmer? Or? No, he was, a, he was, a, how do I explain that? He, he was a, a salesman, you mm-hmm. know, he sells uh, toys and bicycle, uh, you know. A- and... In France, when when you were growing up, uh, I mean, now chef is a re- it's a revered profession. Was it considered more of a, a trade, like a, a, a workman's job, or was it? Did it have a sort of power and an elegance to it that it does have today? Was it, it con- always did? It was considered sort of a, a dignified profession. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, because we have, you know, all those uh, Michelin star rated chefs. And do you have any experiences? Uh, of being a kid and going to either a, a local restaurant or something maybe very fancy in Paris that sticks out in your in your mind of a, of a meal or perhaps a restaurant that you visited that really yes touched you yes for sure um, we my parents were friends with this famous chef uh, named Roger Verger in the south of France and then we used to go over there my parents were doing all those big restaurants sometime on weekends and. They will take me over so I could see and learn and maybe spend some time and visit the kitchen, you know. And uh, at my young age, um, my dad was a friend with uh, the local chef who owned the local one Michelin star restaurant. And they actually, I was spending time in the kitchen at, at, at 12, 13 years old. And what were they letting you do, if anything? <laughs> I know you're going to ask this question. <laughs> I was getting the lemon. <laughs> <laughs> lemon wedges. Lemon, no, uh, we call it lemon uh, dans de l'eau. It means like you do like the wo- the teeth of the wolf inside. The what? The, the teeth, the of, teeth the wolf? of the wolf? Yeah. Mm. So. Oh, it's sort of like the jagged when it fits right, together in right. two pieces. Exactly. And what was that for like put on the plate as presentation on Seafood, the side? Seafood, uh, you know, and stuff like that. So I was uh, doing that and watching the rest of it. I was doing the butter dishes and um, little thing, you know. But that's cool because they were giving you a, maybe a small task, but there's knife skill involved. And they're basically saying, you know, do this off to the side. But if you get really good at it and you show that you can do it for hours and hours right. on end, then, all right, maybe you you can move on to a, to another task. Uh, when you went into the, um, the, the program and then you're finishing up that program, how did you get, did you get placed with the French Navy? Did you apply for that job? How did you end it up? It was not an option. You had to go to the, to the army or the Navy. Okay. So, um, at 17, I, I went um, to the Navy for about um, two years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I got picked up, uh, you know, with your knife skill and what you can cook. I got picked up to to be the chef for a bunch of admiral in uh, in the south of France. So where were you stationed exactly? I was stationed in Toulon, in the south of France. And did you cook on a boat, or were you on the no, on land? No, I was on land. And how were they as 
customers or, <laughs> you know, how did they treat you? No, no, it was good. It was a good experience. We were about, uh, I think, 15 of us uh, on the land. In, uh, uh, it was a small uh, hotel. Uh, we call it Hotel Particulier. And then uh, it's a small hotel, you know. Um, and it was an interesting uh, journey, you know, to do the menus with them and you know it, it was interesting but we didn't really experience the navy like you know we never hold a gun or it was not uh you were this kind of you navy. were cooks you yeah, were just it just chef, so happened yeah. that you were a chef right. in the navy you right. didn't really see any any action right. uh when an admiral says, I want this for dinner. Was it ever hard to acquire ingredients? Like, did they make sort of outlandish demands or were they eating sort of in the style of everyone else? Like, was there, were their dinners really fancy or were they eating sort of in the Navy? They love fancy dinner sometimes. They invite uh, people, political people. And then um, most of the time they were eating regular food like uh, you find at home. Which is what? I mean, what's what, you know, what were you usually cooking for them? You'll have uh, classical roulé à la russe, ham with uh, Macedoine or vegetables, uh, tomato salad, you know. Uh, I mean, pretty basic, basic food, you know. Sure, but I mean, I've, I'm, I'm thinking right now of like what a military ration <laughs> would be for a normal soldier, and it's usually not that, but... Uh, no. But so you're stationed there, and how long did you uh, hold that position for? Two years. And uh, and though, so when you left uh, the Navy, did you have any sort of idea of where you wanted to head? Did you have a, a restaurant in mind or a chef that you were saying, I would love to go work for them? I had no... Uh... <laughs> That, you see, I, I don't even sure I wanted to continue about cooking. Uh -huh. This is where, where, where we were at this time. And then, and then I met this guy who, uh, you know, was uh, sharing the same room as me. And he says, look, uh, before coming to the Navy, I was in London. Uh, if you're interesting, maybe you can come. Like, you know, I don't speak English well, you know. And, and he goes, well, why don't we take a weekend and, and go visit London for a weekend and I can introduce you and you can see, you can meet people, you can see if you like the city. And then I loved it. And then I, I moved to London. And you ended up at a gentleman's club. Right. Called Booties. Boodles. Boodles. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the jeans. The jean. Tell me about that. Was it a... What does that mean, gentlemen's club? Was it a, a men-only place that, that you went and got a meal? Was it a sort of like a burlesque club? What, did, what happened no, there? No, it's, uh, you know, we, it, it's, it's by members only. And mm -hmm. then uh, it's a gentleman's club, very uh, British-oriented uh, club where men get together, dressed up, um, smoking cigar, eating a bite, uh, drinking port. You know, it's very... Um, serious club you know you have to be uh, sponsored by other members and uh, Prince Charles was the uh, actual uh, you know l leader of the of the club so it was a pretty serious thing we we accommodate you know a lot of uh, personality uh, London aristocracy and so at that point you're really kind of uh you're cooking for like the creme de la creme, the, yeah. the top of the the London elite. Um, were you using? Was it a French technique? Was it uh, in the in the menu design and in the restaurant, or were you making more British style cuisine for them? It was a combination of some British food, very classic British food, and also a combination of classic French based on the Escoffier uh, cooking culinary. Um, and what's that? Can you describe the Escoffier, that the Escoffier yeah. is basically a, a Bible uh, created by a chef uh, named Escoffier uh, in uh, early, uh, late uh, night, uh, 18, early 1900, where we all refer until this day uh, about some classic uh, recipes uh, of the basic and that's where you can find the, the mother sauces and right. things of that nature. Stock, um, classic sauces, uh, preparation. So really the, the building blocks of a, of a dish come from the specifics of right. Escoffier. Right. So the, 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 the interesting part of it, it was really for me to stay and stick up to the 
to, to this club and, and learn uh, the basic. And uh, I found it uh, British cooking very interesting, actually, uh, because it was actually very well made and it tasted amazing, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, strangely enough, uh, you know, people uh, think the British cooking is not very interesting. So I think it's pretty interesting when he's when he's well made. It has a it has a bad reputation. I know. It's still to this day, unfortunately. Why do you why do you think that is that? I think uh, most of the the British cooking is not well made, um, but I think when it's well made, I think it's some cool stuff actually. What's a very traditional British dish that you would have? served then that would have been on the menu at the gentleman's club shepherd's pie mm -hmm. steak and kidney pie um christmas pudding i mean there was it was a little bit of from everywhere in england and, and s some of them were very interesting but but it was it was very well managed as a as a french brigade inside the kitchen you know we had the first commie second commie chef de party the chef de party uh, you know the sous chef, executive sous chef. I mean, it was a, it was a big, a big brigade, you know. And so, the the hierarchy, that structure, that's something that you must have been very familiar with coming from uh, from France and being classically trained. Were there people in the kitchen? Did you have a sort of an international staff uh, at that point in the kitchen, or was it mostly French chefs that had come over to London? Uh, no, it was, I was the only French, actually, in the brigade. Most of them were Scottish, uh, a couple of Irish, most of British. How was your adjustment to living in London? It's not terribly far. Rough. <laughs> <laughs> Rough. Uh, why? Was it because of the language? Like, yes. wh What were the things that, that made London difficult for you? I mean, challenging by, by the language, for sure, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I lived uh, with two Scottish guys. We shared a house in, in Greenwich and then uh, understand their accent. And it was, and, and at work, it was really challenging because I, I, I didn't speak a word of English. So I really had to learn. Uh, I feel like even if you can speak perfect English, uh, two Scotsmen together is going Rough. to be difficult. Rough. There's going to be a lot of fast <laughs> talking that's going to go over your head. Right. Uh, did you find that um, from, a, from a cultural perspective that, that living in London was very different from where you had come from in France? Like, were you mostly in the kitchen or when you had free time, was, was there a culture shock at all by being in London? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, definitely. I mean, I only lived in my little village in France and then Going to London was like reaching the big city and, you know, how, you know, what, it's completely different, you know. Was it, uh, was it common at that time for uh, people that had been classically trained in France, in French technique, and uh, to then go abroad? Was that things that, was that always happening or were you kind of an outlier? For you to leave France and not take a position uh, at, at a you know one or two michelin or three michelin star restaurant in france right away was that considered out of the norm uh yes uh, uh, you know uh, culinary wise i don't think i had the the level of going to a, a three michelin star i think i needed to understand and study something else before um and i did that later uh, as a matter of fact but yes it was kind of like a little bit strange you know, of uh, of the many places that that you've worked, uh, you've worked in France and Manhattan and Moscow and in London. Is there one specific restaurant or a chef that you feel that you learned the the most from, or that that helped you grow, that shaped you the most over a period of time? I think all of them matters in a different way. I don't think there is one particular one. Uh, they were the rough, the rock and roll people. They were the guy who were classic, who were very intense. They were, you know, I think they, they teach me, they taught me different things. Now that you uh, have for so many years been in charge of many restaurants, uh, how do you think all the places that you went and worked informed your leadership style and the way you run a kitchen. Sometimes uh, these days uh, people can inherit kitchens 
quite quickly. It doesn't uh, take as long, maybe, to rise to the position of uh, chef de cuisine or executive chef as it as it used to. Um, you worked for a very, very long time in many different places. Uh, how did that impact the way that you run your kitchens? I think I adjust myself for what's going on now, you know. I mean, I, I think uh, there's different talent. There is different... Um, different style different kind of chefs those days you know we some people who I work with then they don't even know the knowledge of a classic cuisine you know and I'm not sure you need that anymore actually hmm. I mean of course it's a controversy I mean you will have probably chef who is standing next to me right now who will scream at me but uh, you know I find really interesting about some of the chefs who do not have an amazing experience, but who have an amazing palate and who come up with some amazing dishes, you know, being non-traditional and being creative. I'm not sure everything works when it's put on the plate, but I tasted some I mean, amazing dishes done by people who are not trained at all. There can be sort of a, a freedom to not being classically trained that right. allows you to extend beyond the realm of what should or could be put on the plate and sometimes it can hit and other times it can definitely miss uh in your experience with sort of the new style of of cook where you know a lot of people are uh looking to rise quite quickly and perhaps not uh putting in the work that used to happen do you encounter a lot of people in your restaurants that do you ever just sort of shake your head and say, like, that person, they don't have what it takes? Do you see a lot of people that these days don't have the sort of drive and passion that you would have seen 15 or 20 years ago? Or do you think do you think it's similar? Similar or different as it was 15 or 20 years ago? I think it's different, uh, but equally uh, interesting by cooks learning in a different way. I, I don't know. I, I think, uh, like I said to you uh, before, I... You know, I test some stuff some day, some t some time, and I'm like, I will never have the idea of mixing it together, okay? And something bright comes out, and I'm like, wow, this is amazing, you know? We're here with Sh Chef Laurent Tarondel. We are going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back here on the line. This episode is brought to you by Castor and Pollux, maker of America's number one organic pet food, Organics. You put a lot of care and thought into what you eat. After all, you're a food radio listener. That thoughtfulness goes hand in paw with how you feed your pets. Purposeful pet food doesn't happen by accident. Castor and Pollux scours the earth to carefully select the best organic and responsibly sourced ingredients. New Pristine from Castor and Pollux is the only complete line of pet food made with ingredients that are responsibly raised, caught, or grown. Feed your dog or cat the new standard, like grass-fed beef, wild-caught fish, and vegetables grown without synthetic fertilizers or chemical pesticides. Pristine from Castor and Pollux. Purposeful pet food. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org slash pets. Welcome back to The Line here on Heritage Radio. I am joined with by Chef Laurent Tarondel, a classically trained French chef who was in 2007 named Restaurant Tour of the Year by Bon Appetit magazine. He has many projects that he's worked on over the years, and I'm just going to rattle off a couple because there are so many, and, and we won't have time to cover them all, but there's LT Steak and Seafood in Miami. There's The Vine in New York City. There's LT Bar and Grill in Kazakhstan. There's LT Burger in Sag Harbor. There's Brasserie Ruhlman in New York City. You're opening up another restaurant in Miami very soon. Is it called Poeti? No. 
It's, we changed the name. Oh, what is it called? <laughs> it's called the Halley. The Halley? Yeah. Cool. So really almost more projects than I can even list and wrap my head around. Uh, as a very, very young chef entrepreneur, I have one very, very small restaurant with 10 seats that I just started. I'm going to ask you a question that's... Congratulations. It's, thank you very much. It's going to sound very open-ended, but... How? <laughs> Just how How do you do it? How do you have so many projects in the works? And how have you been so successful building such a large group of restaurant projects that, that are both casual and, and high-end? Right. Um, I think I, I think, well, first of all, I work a lot. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I work constantly. Uh, even if I'm not at work, I think about work and I, my, my brain's still on it, uh, even on my time off, of course. But, um, you know, I always have this desire of coming up with a uh, different concepts. So it could be a fine dining. It could be, you know, I w- I'm always interested in thing about doing something new. Uh, you know, we went through the, the burger joint. We went to the French brasserie. Uh, you know, I did, uh, some sushi bar, we did uh, a lot of steakhouse, I think maybe 20 steakhouse, um, high-end seafood restaurant, casual fish shack, uh, Italian now, pizzeria, I mean, you know. Yeah, I mean, you're, co- you're sort of covering <laughs> all the <laughs> cu- right, right. cuisines possible. Right. Did you... Was it was it a, the partnership that kind of fueled things forward? And you said, "I've got an idea," and then a team took that concept with with your menu and pushed it forward. Uh, I know that that a lot of these have have spawned multiple units. They're sort of call them a, a mid sized chain essentially at this point. Um, how, how did that come to be? Did someone approach you and say, "We'd love to do a steakhouse with you, a burger joint"? Did you find partners and to raise capital? Like, how exactly did it come to be? Uh, it was different stage in my career. I had business partner, which uh, I left uh, years ago. And then now the structure of my business are completely different. Some of them are, uh, I own, some of them I own with different partners. Uh, some of them, I, uh, it's, they are management deal. Some of them are licensing deal. And some of them are consulting. So in every case, it's a different structure of business. So you listed a couple things there, and I'm hoping that we can just get a little bit of clarification. So what is the difference between a licensing and management? Management, you manage the operation Mm -hmm. uh, from the accounting to the waiter to the staff to the PR to everything. Licensing, you're licensing your name, uh, meaning you have a little control on it, but it depends how you negotiate. You could have a, a, a larger control over your name or you can let it lose. Mm. How, how, how does it feel to be a chef that has opened his own restaurants multiple times and then to do consulting or to do a licensing and see things that uh, represent you but that you don't have full control over? Was that a difficult decision the first time you did it to sort of relinquish the control or...? You know, it's all related to food. So for me, I look at it as uh, the quality of food is coming out, okay? Uh, either it's my own restaurant or licensing or management deal. It still matters, the quality of the food. So in either way, it's difficult, <laughs> you know? So this is the way I look at it. Do you have uh, a corporate chefs or a traveling uh, chef de cuisine or, or executive chef that that comes with you to check on quality control and things of that nature? Yes, that I do. I have a corporate chef who's very good, uh, who's been with me for a couple of years now. And then uh, sometimes we travel together, sometimes he travels alone or I travel alone. You know. it, it does seem kind of mind-boggling to just have, you know... Between all these places, it's several hundred people when you look at front of house, back of house, uh, PR, uh, right. HR, all these things. Um, did you, did it happen in a way that you've been able to kind of uh, grow accustomed to the size of the operation that you are? Or does it surprise you at the size of your operation still? 
No, I think, uh, you know, project come and go. Um, you know, some of the restaurants I have, they've been open for 15 years. Some of them are just open, you know. Uh, so I don't, um, I don't think about that. I think about, most important for me is really to open restaurant I want to open and my passion is inside. If it's a restaurant just to do a restaurant, I, I'm not excited about it. Uh, I'm not going to do it. You know, I have a lot of project offer. And um, I turned down a lot of things because uh, it's not what I want to do. You know. So where do you call home? Where is your home base? New York. Mm -hmm. I live in New York. Yeah. And uh, and how often would you say that you're on the road? Like you've got a spot in Kazakhstan that you worked on. You've got spots in Miami. Do you uh, do you go weeks at a time where you're on planes and traveling around? It depends where it is. I actually just came back from Kazakhstan. We stayed uh, a week. Mm -hmm. uh, when I go to Asia, also in Hong Kong, I stay a week. When I go uh, in the United States, I stay three days. You know, uh, it depends where, where the location of the restaurant is and, and what is the problem. Because I always go with the problem, you know. Okay, this, so... so Awesome. Tell me specifically about a problem that you flew to Hong Kong or Kazakhstan for. And uh, what does that look like when you show up and they say, chef is here. Right. <laughs> chef has arrived right. from New York City. Like, right. you know, I mean, look, it's always it's always, um, you know, a management issue. Um, and, and I think what we do uh, the, the the real issue are the the staffing doesn't matter where you are in the United States or in Asia mm -hmm. in Asia a bit less because the labor is it's a good labor and uh, they work hard you know um, so it, you know it, it, it depends where I go the you know, situation is different all the time and uh, and when you show up there at your various locations. To you, is there a separation between chef and business person, or is it this? Is it the same role within within you? Hmm. I don't know. I never thought about uh, making a difference. I, I'm not too sure. Um, I mean, business is business, you know. Uh, yeah, I guess it's a difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I ask because you know there are. I think. There are people that have a mind for cooking and leading a kitchen, and there are people that have a mind for business and expansion and right. understanding licensing deals and management deals. It seems like you've been able to master both worlds. Uh, how how have you gone about you know retaining your passion for the food, but also realizing that there's so many? I mean, you must go days without, unfortunately cooking right there's a lot of business that has to happen and meetings and things of that nature that kind of pull you away or is it not like that really um you know it's not really like that no i, I try to uh schedule myself where um i do meetings in the morning or i do meetings in the afternoon and i try to spend lunch and dinner in some of my restaurant t doing pure service and uh, development with my corporate chef or uh, the chef de cuisine for new dishes, new menus, you know. Is there, uh, do you ever get, is there ever like a favorite or like a, like a, you know, like a child that you're really focusing on? Like, do you sometimes spend uh, a couple weeks straight in one of your New York restaurants because you just, you're having the best time and like it feels fresh to you? Like when you open a new spot, do you, do you go for the first two months that it's open and for sure. kind of, yeah, you spend a lot of yeah. time there? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, my base restaurant right now, it's uh, L'Amico in New York, um, this Italian restaurant. Uh, where we do both restaurants, actually, we do the vine and Namico. So that's where I spend the most time right now. Um, it's also uh, uh, something new about the, the Italian food uh, I have in me and uh, uh, kind of like interesting and very enjoyable to do. Is, is the act of service a thrill to you? Do you like the the tickets coming in and the sort of the hustle bustle of the kitchen or do you prefer sort of pre-service the the prep and the organization is there one thing that you enjoy doing more as a as a as a chef i like the service mm -hmm. yeah i like the the adrenaline adrenaline coming out you know yeah uh, 
and then uh, you know I like to see who's coming to the restaurant I like to see the VIPs I like to you know it's, it's an interesting thing you know do you do uh, research and development in a centralized location for for new projects like do you have uh, do you have a specific time where you all where your corporate chef or your your team goes to a restaurant and you're developing things for upcoming projects or does it not does it work slightly more organically where you just people have ideas and maybe they share them all at different times right i mean like i say every project is different like right now we're working on a pizzeria in miami mm -hmm. so we have we have experience in pizzeria already so we actually uh, you know, transforming the the recipes a little bit uh, to the Miami style, uh, but we're not changing everything. So we do some development. Uh, when is new, completely new concept? Then either we go, we we take a team and we go to the restaurant and we do the opening. And I have already an idea about the menu and the presentation and and uh, how it's supposed to look on the plate, uh, but. You know, development, pure development. We don't have a space where we do only development. No. So you have all these projects. There's many in the works and more coming. Do you think that you'll? Is there a, a specific set goal in mind, or do you just sort of, as projects come, you evaluate whether they're right or not? I guess what I'm asking is, do you ever think there'll be a time when you'll stop opening things and you'll sort of just stay in, in one restaurant and that'll be your restaurant or do you enjoy opening things too much to do that? No, I think there will be this day, yeah. This day exists. I don't know when it is, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, look, uh, it's it's been my 51st or 52nd restaurant opening. So I, at some point, you know, enough it's enough. <laughs> but I, I'm still <laughs> enjoying it. And I love and, that. Uh, uh, 52, <laughs> sooner or later it'll be enough. Is yeah. enough. Um, so in your, in your current, uh, format of the, all these restaurant projects th that you're opening, um, do you, are you the CEO or do you have a, uh, a partner who takes on that role? No, I have nobody. I'm, I'm I don't give myself a title, you know, <laughs> uh, I just am not sure how you find the time in the day since you said that you work service at your at your restaurant. But right. I imagine that uh, you field phone calls and emails from other projects and things of that nature. Have you just have you built a strong infrastructure that allows you to uh, how do you focus on service when you know that there's 12, 15 other restaurants that are running uh in various cities uh, around the world? Like, how do you compartmentalize all these projects that you have? I mean, look, you have to trust people who work for you in each individual restaurant. Uh, I'm up early to do email, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, you know, we, we have a good team. I have an assistant um, and a corporate chef, and then we run it this way. Uh, when was the last time you uh, went on a vacation? Last week. Where'd you go? <laughs> India. <laughs> Were you doing research, though, for a restaurant? No, not at all. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was uh, actually the, my dad's birthday, and I took him for this birthday. Uh, I don't see him a lot. He lives in France. So we uh, actually you know, took him on a journey in India. Sounds great. Well, I'm glad you got to take a little bit of time for yourself. Yeah. So the restaurant in New York, The Vine, and Lamicchio, where are those located? Yeah, Lamico. Lamico. The, the friend in Italian. <laughs> <laughs> and where are they located? Also, they are on 29 and 6th Avenue in the Eventi Hotel. It's a Kington and, property. And for those looking to find your new project that's opening in Miami, it's in a hotel. Which hotel is it? It's in the Betsy Hotel, and it's in, uh, in between Collins and uh, Ocean Drive on 14th Street. Well, as you heard, everyone, there's a, quite a few restaurants where you can go to taste his cuisine. Chef, thank you so much for thank joining you. us and talking a little bit about uh, your business structure and also uh, your story and how you ended up in New York City. It's been a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you for having me. Join us every Tuesday at 11 a.m. for new episodes of The Line here on Heritage Radio.
Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. everybody, I'm Nick Layton. And I'm Leah Bonima. And we're the hosts of Were You Raised by Wolves? Each week we try to make the world a kinder, nicer place. Well, that's the idea at least. I mean, we try. Have you ever wondered what to do if you're ghosted? Or what to do when a friend asks you to borrow money? Or the proper way to eat Cheetos? You know, the big questions. So please find Were You Raised by Wolves wherever you listen. Listen.